All right. So I'm going to go ahead and begin. It looks like our our uh, attendees are starting to slow down a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and kick it off and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Nathan Dore. I'm the curator here at the Draper Natural History Museum. Uh, and uh, my assistant curator, Corey Inko, is joining us on the back end of technology today. Uh, again, thank you all for joining us for today's virtual lunchtime expedition. Uh, we've got a full house for registrants today uh, and couldn't be more excited to have everyone joining us, uh, especially our speakers today. Uh, today's presentation is part of a new special exhibition here at the center, uh, the center of the West of the same name, What Lies Beneath, Exploring Yellowstone Lake's Mysterious Events. The exhibit is open now and will remain open through August 8th. After a temporary deinstall, it will be back on view in October with a few special editions. So for those of you uh, who are able to join us uh, this summer to come and visit it, and you have a chance to come back uh, October through May uh, next year, uh, there'll be some great additions. A reminder that support for the Draper's Lunchtime Expedition Series has been made possible by Sage Creek Ranch and the Nancy Carroll Draper Charitable Foundation. These sponsorships help make these programs possible. Uh, and of course, we're also grateful to you, all of our audience, uh, for your attendance, your feedback, and your support of these programs. As I mentioned, we do record lunchtime expeditions and post them to our Draper YouTube channel. So if you've missed any of our previous speakers, you can find the presentations there. In addition to those of you joining us here on the Zoom webinar, we're also broadcasting today's presentation over on Facebook Live. Uh, so please, whether you're joining us here on the webinar directly or on Facebook, please feel free to submit your questions on Zoom. You can submit them uh, via chat or the Q&A feature. And if you're over there on Facebook Live, uh, feel free to add them to the comment section. We'll gather those and relay your questions to our speakers uh, at the end of their presentation. So with that, uh, today we are joined by uh, Dr. Rob Zone and Chris Linder from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Rob is a uh, geologist uh, specializing in the study of hot springs and geysers. Uh, he obtained a BS in mechanical engineering from Purdue University in 1987 worked uh, as an acoustics engineer from the Douglas Aircraft Company, and then obtained a PhD in oceanography from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Uh, he has been a research scientist at Woods Hole uh, since 1999, where he has spent his early career studying deep sea vent fields, including several dives in the submersible Alvin. Chris Linder, our, our other speaker, specializes in photographing scientific field work and wildlife in extreme environments. A former US Navy officer and oceanographic researcher, Linder has photographed more than 50 scientific expeditions from Antarctica to the Congo. His goals as a photographer are to educate the public with uh, without in uh, about, I can't talk today, about environmental science and communicate the need to protect our planet's wild uh, places. So without further ado, please welcome our May lunchtime expedition speakers, Rob Zone and Chris Linder. Rob, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, let's see if we can make the technology work here. Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining. This is really a, a unique experience for me. Uh, like most or all of you, uh, I went into some form of isolation a little over a year ago uh, when the pandemic hit. And, you know, normally as a scientist, I do a lot of traveling. Um, I'll give a lot of talks. But since then, I haven't done any traveling. I haven't given any talks. So this is the first time I've given a presentation uh, virtually like this. Um, so I hope you'll bear with me a little bit if my chops aren't, aren't quite up to speed. Um, but I'm going to just try to give you a little bit of background on the science uh, behind uh, the project that Chris photographed. Uh, spectacularly, I think you'll agree when, when you see the exhibit, which I hope, hope you all will. But our project uh, was called the HDY Lake or Hydrothermal Dynamics of Yellowstone Lake. Um, it's a, a lot relatively large by uh, the standards um, project with various disciplines ranging from geophysics, geochemistry, 
paleoecology, geology, microbiology, and, and others. Um, we did three years of field work in Yellowstone Lake from 2016 to 2018. So the last piece of kit came out of the lake about two and a half years ago. And since then, we've been working really hard on the samples and the data um, to try to put together uh, the scientific story. Um, these um, lake floor hydrothermal systems, of course, you know, the thermal features in Yellowstone uh, were stuff of legend and myth, really, in the Old West. Um, people didn't believe the initial reports of, you know, water shooting from the ground and all this kind of stuff. Um, but eventually, of course, that was all verified and, and scientists, as you can imagine, have been very interested in, in Yellowstone's thermal areas uh, ever since, uh, you know, Western man, so to speak, uh, started occupying the, the area. And there's a huge body of literature on the thermal features in Yellowstone, but the systems in Yellowstone Lake were only known to science in sort of a formal way about, let's say, 20 years ago or so. Um, so these are thermal features, of course, they're very hard to access because they're underwater, but they're also ones that sort of escaped our scientific knowledge for quite a long time. So we're trying to kind of make up for lost time here and really uh, do as much studying as, as we can. And what we were trying to understand is how these lake floor hydrothermal systems respond to different kinds of perturbations or changes. Um, for example, things like earthquakes, um, uh, the changing climate of the region, um, the, the water column, the lake's water itself is constantly moving. Um, how do these sorts of things uh, influence and affect the hydrothermal systems? And you'll understand why we care about that uh, better in, in just a minute. Uh, and before I launch into all that, I want to take a moment to recognize uh, our major sponsor, the National Science Foundation. Um, that means uh, all of you supported this research and I hope you feel good about it. Um, this project probably cost the average person around a quarter of a cent. Um, so I hope you'll feel like your quarter of a cent investment uh, is gonna give a good return. But we're very uh, you know, sort of mindful that our obligation ultimately is to the, the taxpayer. Uh, we take that very seriously and, and try to produce uh, the highest quality and the largest volume of research with the funding we receive. Uh, the U.S. Geological Survey, USGS, also was heavily involved in this project, um, and they pro provide a lot of in-kind support. Um, a lot of their personnel they assigned or allowed to work on the project. They provided trailers that we uh, stayed in over the field seasons and so forth. So I also want to acknowledge um, the USGS. And the other thing I want to do is just take a quick moment to recognize, um, you know, I'm sitting here as a scientist representing the project, uh, and I get to, uh, as the lead PI, tell you about what everyone else has been doing. 99% uh, of the time, being the lead PI is a pain in the you-know-what. But there's a few moments like these where I get to sort of bask in in the glory um, of the work that this incredible team has done. Um, and there were more than 10 different uh, academic and federal institutions, uh, private, public, and otherwise, in the US and Europe uh, that were involved in this research. And the sort of uh, idea um, you know, kind of one of the selling points uh, when we were uh, pitching this project to the Science Foundation. What we really wanted to do is bring together kind of two distinct groups of people. On the one hand, uh, we have people who are absolute experts in Yellowstone science, um, particularly with respect to thermal areas. Um, and on the other hand, we have people who are the absolute world's experts in using deep sea technology to study things like hydrothermal vents, you know, in the deep sea. Um, clearly, having these vents on the floor of the lake, the lake's pretty deep. Uh, it's over 100 meters deep. So, you know, uh, you can do your math, but let's say 340, 350 feet deep. So it's very deep. You can't just jump in the water with a snorkel and a mask and, and go look at the vents. Um, and so 
this project really represents kind of a union or a coming together of those two communities uh, to really try and advance our understanding of the lake. So I just want to give uh, a little kind of brief uh, background on the thermal features in Yellowstone in, in general to give you a sense of, of why it's so important to study the ones in the lake. And uh, if, I hope many or most of you have been to the park and if you haven't, you know, get there as fast as you can. It's one of the most spectacular landscapes anywhere on earth. And one of the things that makes it so spectacular is the wide variety and incredible quantity of thermal features that you see when you, when you go through the park. And more than 10,000 thermal features have been documented uh, in Yellowstone. And there's an incredible variety and this graphic attempts to illustrate that. Um, and you know, first and foremost, you have to understand that the only reason any of this is happening is because there's magma in the crust beneath Yellowstone. And there's, there's quite a lot of it, actually. It's a very large body of magma. And in fact, scientists who really study this will tell you there's actually two uh, distinct bodies of magma. But that magma is providing all the heat that drives these thermal features. So that's the most fundamental aspect in a sense. Then once those uh, waters, those natural waters get heated and they also exchange uh, minerals with the rocks, then they'll start percolating up. You know, they might have to go uh, for, uh, let's say three miles uh, through the crust vertically to get from the zone where they get heated up until you can see them as one of these brilliant uh, thermal pools or, or whatever. So it's a long journey and a lot can happen along that journey. And depending exactly on what happens and where, when they finally get to the surface, they could be manifested as a travertine, uh, like you see it in Mammoth in a very spectacular way. You know, mud pots, uh, like in mud volcano, fumaroles, same thing. Geysers, um, incredibly enough, over half of all the geysers in the world are in Yellowstone National Park. Um, spectacular features that I've spent a lot of time myself actually studying. Um, and then finally, you know, over on the right side of this uh, image, you see Yellowstone Lake. And again, as I mentioned, we've only known about these events in the last few decades. But there's a whole other class of events that are underwater, under pretty deep water in the lake. Um, and so now if we try to put that into to context, on the left-hand panel, um, you have an, an overview of where the thermal areas are uh, in Yellowstone as a, in a general sense. Um, you can see the lake there, it's sort of in the middle. That dash dotted line is the outline of the uh, 640,000 year Yellowstone caldera. So the last major catastrophic eruption um, drained magma out of the crust over an area roughly that size. Um, so it's, it's huge, you know, most volcanoes, you can stand on the lip and you can see the entire caldera in Yellowstone. You can't do that. It's far too big. Um, but the point I want to really make here is that if you go to Yellowstone there, we, the scientists, we divide all the thermal areas up into two different classifications. Um, and they're shown here on the left panel as green and black symbols. The green symbols are neutral to alkaline. So these are the sapphire pools uh, and the geyser systems. And you can see that a lot of them are there in the upper, mid and lower geyser basin, geyser basin uh, sorry, midway geyser basin. Um, and then the other kind are these acidic, um, steam heated, they're represented in black. And you can see that in general, they're located in different places, but in point of fact, they can be very close to each other. And so, you know, I don't want to hurt anybody with too much hardcore science, but if you want to understand uh, the thermal areas in Yellowstone, you have to understand a little bit about this phase diagram on the right hand side. And I just want to take a quick minute to kind of walk us through the, the fundamentals here. And on the left side, you know, so we have pressure, increasing pressure on this axis and increasing temperature on this axis. It's not a linear axis, it's a conceptual diagram. 
But you know, when things are cold, they're solids. When they're in the middle, they're liquids. And when they're really hot, they're gases. That's a general rule of thumb. And you know, here at one atmosphere pressure, where most of us live at, at sea level and in Yellowstone area, you're a little bit less pressure because you're higher up. But we really experience this phase diagram on the on this x-axis. We experience a, one pressure and the temperature is going to change. And so we all understand this intuitively from a very young age at a certain temperature and Celsius scale is nice and convenient, zero, water freezes into ice. And then as it heats up, eventually at 100 degrees C, 212 F, it turns into steam and becomes a gas. And we all understand that. So the first thing I'll point out is that this boundary between a gas and a liquid, what you might think of as the boiling point, um, as you increase the pressure, that temperature goes up and up and up and up and up. So that uh, water can persist as a liquid at very high temperatures if the pressure is very high. And on the floor of Yellowstone Lake, the pressure is approximately five atmospheres. So, or sorry, 11 <laughs> atmospheres. Um, about 11 times as much pressure as, as you experience walking around. Um, which is actually quite a lot. And that changes the boiling uh, temperature from 100 degrees C to 173 degrees C. It almost doubles it. So the fluids that are discharging into the lake, on the bottom of the lake, they're actually at temperatures up to 173 degrees C, which is about 343 Fahrenheit. They're, they're hotter than you can imagine water ever being. They're incredibly hot. And that means that the hottest thermal areas in Yellowstone are the ones on the floor of Yellowstone Lake. And so that gives scientists the opportunity to actually sample and study these fluids before they've decompressed all the way to uh, one atmosphere pressure, which is where we normally get to look at these, um, at these fluids. So this is really going to the bottom of the lake is like getting this incredible window that is impossible to get any other place in the park into the, the very hot sort of more primitive fluids before they fully separated uh, out and boiled off all their constituents. Um, so as hydrothermal fluids are coming up from that magma chamber very, very deep, they're coming up along this boiling curve, okay? And, you know, when they're deep, they might be 300 degrees or something, and they come up and the boiling temperature all of a sudden is much lower. And these, these, these fluids are too hot. And they, they are subject to the laws of thermodynamics, just like the rest of us. And so in order to stay in thermodynamic equilibrium, they have to lose heat, they have to cool down. And the way they do that is by releasing steam. So as these fluids are coming up through the crust, they're continually boiling off steam. And the, the magmas have a lot of volcanic gases in them, like carbon dioxide uh, and hydrogen sulfide. And those gases, when the water boils off uh, steam to stay in thermodynamic equilibrium, those gases go with the steam. And that separation process is what gives us these two different kinds of thermal areas. So the neutral to alkaline, like the geyser basins, these are the liquids that have stayed as a liquid the entire time on that journey from uh, the magma chamber to the ground surface. And these acid or steam heated systems, these are the, these are the, the, the steam and the volcanic gases um, that have boiled off of these liquids. And then for reasons that we don't totally understand, um, they have different propagation paths through through the crust. So that's the basics. There's two different kinds of thermal areas in Yellowstone. And now if we look at the lake, um, this red line here is representing that caldera boundary. So what you can see is that the, the northern and kind of northwestern part of the lake is inside the caldera. And then the southeastern part of the lake, uh, the two arms in particular, are outside of the caldera. And sure enough, uh, what we find is that all these hydrothermal vents, uh, which have been mapped here, shown as pink dots, for the most part, except for this guy, um, are in areas that are inside the caldera, where we have that magmatic heat um, 
to fuel the, the circulation. And the reason that we're really interested in how the lake responds or the, how these hydrothermal systems respond to changes in perturbations is because they have a tendency to explode, which is a little concerning. Um, Yellowstone Lake itself, uh, it formed after the last glacier retreated uh, from this area, something like 13,000 years ago. You know, if you want to get in a good bar argument with a geologist, you know, you can debate whether it's 13,000 or 14,000. That can be a lot of fun. But it's about 13,000 years ago. And since that time, um, and we know the number now much better because of work done in our project, there have been at least 16 hydrothermal explosions in the lake. Well, what's a hydrothermal explosion? A hydrothermal explosion is a situation where we have all these hot fluids. Um, they can be liquids or gas or what have you in the crust. And for some reason, they decide to spontaneously explode. And some of those um, can be very catastrophic. Um, and what you're basically looking at is we're talking about you know, being on this boiling curve. So these fluids here are in equilibrium and somehow the, they get depressurized. The pressure on those fluids suddenly is released and that pushes them up into this unstable field. And so they then, the liquids flash to steam, the gases expand and you have a major explosion. And there've been at least two really catastrophic events uh, since the last glaciation. I'll just mention that, you know, you might think, well, how do you depressurize a fluid? And it's a good question. But the fact that these systems are on the floor of a lake and are covered with water is the big clue. And so you can move water around, right? And there's sort of two uh, hypotheses. Um, and they don't have to be, you know, they can act together. But you know, if you have an earthquake, and we know Yellowstone area is one of the most seismically active areas in the world, you have a large earthquake in the same way that an earthquake that's under uh, the ocean can create a tsunami, an earthquake that's under the lake or very close to the lake can create a lake tsunami, uh, where the water just starts sloshing around. You could think of it as a giant bathtub. You know, you could shake a bathtub or something. And that has the potential to move water very quickly. Um, and that's a process that could easily depressurize um, the lake floor vents. And as I mentioned, uh, the lake has been forming uh, after the last glaciation, so the glaciers have been retreating. Um, and there's also the possibility that, you know, you have these glacial dams that hold back water. And if you were to breach one of those dams, you could spill tremendously large volumes of water out of the lake very quickly. That's another way you can depressurize these systems. And this is an artist rendering of the Mary Bay explosion crater. So this Yellowstone Lake in, in Mary Bay, um, I know at least one person is uh, listening to this talk from Fishing Bridge Visitor Center. You know, in other words, under kind of the, the steam cloud in this photo or this, sorry, this drawing. Um, but this explosion crater is Two, about two and a half kilometers wide. It's, about, it's over 100 meters deep and it distributed explosion breccia uh, materials over an area of 30 square kilometers. And it's the largest su such feature in the world. I don't know if that makes us lucky to have it or not. Um, but this kind of catastrophic event represents a very significant geological hazard for Yellowstone. And we'd really like to understand better uh, for example, what kind of things can cause uh, an event like this? And so, as I mentioned, um, uh, you know, one of the sort of key aspects of this project is, is bringing some, some really new state-of-the-art technology into the lake, um, tools that were uh, developed uh, for deep sea uh, research. Um, the, our project in general, uh, we sort of had a, a two-pronged, if you will, approach. Um, in order to understand uh, this system, we put instrumentation on the lake floor to monitor the modern system, to monitor what's happening right now. And we also had a very extensive coring program where we sampled long sediment cores. And the way, you know, that works, the, there's um, 
diatoms that are continually falling out of uh, the water column after they die, you know, plankton basically, and they're creating the sediments on the lake floor. But then when something kind of geologically interesting, interesting happens, like a hydrothermal explosion, for example, that gets deposited in the sediments. And then of course it gets buried as more sediments pile up on it. So that these cores, they contain the, the geological history of the lake. And it's a tricky thing to interpret that. But anyway, our project had those two components. We had a modern day in, uh, monitoring instrumentation, which is where really the high technology came in. And then a coring program uh, looking at the history. So I'm just gonna give you um, a little overview. And this is one of Chris's wonderful photos, by the way, um, of the technology. And the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration um, built a research vessel, uh, tailor-made, if you will, to Yellowstone Lake. There are restrictions about how large of a vessel you can have in the lake, for example. Uh, this uh, research vessel is called Annie, and it's exactly as long as it can be and, and not an inch longer or shorter. Um, and the Global Foundation really spent a lot of time designing this thing so they could do the most science possible given the restriction on length. And they did a wonderful job. Uh, so there's a state-of-the-art research vessel uh, that can work in Yellowstone Lake now. It's very exciting development. The other side to that uh, story then is this uh, remotely operated vehicle Yogi. And if we're talking about underwater robotics, you basically have two options. You can either put your robot on the end of a wire and control it from the ship, you know, with fancy joysticks and stuff like that. Or you can have a completely free swimming robot where you program a, a mission, put it in the water, you know, hit run and pray for the best where you have no connection um, to the robot. We use both kinds in this study. And so Yogi is an example of a, a robot on the end of a wire. You can see the yellow cable there. That's not just any wire, by the way, that's very <laughs> expensive wire. Don't step on it, okay? Um, but Yogi, um, it has a manipulator arm uh, that you can kind of see. It's, it's furled up right now as it's getting in the water, but um, engineers on the, on the research vessel can, it's a fully articulating like five or seven function arm with a wrist and a claw and so forth. So it can manipulate in a very, fine way uh, instruments or samples that you're trying to collect. Um, it has super high tech video banks, uh, video cameras and so forth. Um, and this is, you know, so exciting that the researchers working in the park have access to this kind of truly cutting edge technology. And it really made a lot of what we did possible. So this is just a, an example what it looks like uh, in the control room on that uh, research vessel, Annie. Close all the doors, draw all the blinds so it's nice and dark. And you can see the pilot there working the joysticks uh, in the middle. And there's something like six different video cameras. So you can see in front, behind, to the side and so forth. Uh, and then you've got a navigator who's in the foreground and then a data guy uh, who's in the background and these three engineers are running this uh, high-tech robot. You can see in the screen there, they're near the lake floor with the manipulator working. And I'm the privileged scientist that gets to stand behind them and say, okay, move over this way a little bit. No, not there, okay, okay, yeah, try grabbing that. Oh, try, you know, so it's pretty good work if you can get it. And the other kind of robot that we use for this study uh, is a free swimming, fully autonomous in the industry, we call them AUVs, autonomous underwater vehicles. Uh, this is an example here. This is a, a robot that's built here in Woods Hole uh, at my institution. Um, and you lower this thing into the water and you let it swim away and, and do its uh, science. And you can actually go do something else while it's working, which is pretty cool. Um, 
this is uh, the same uh, type of vehicle, by the way, that was used to find the Air France uh, Flight 447 wreckage in the Atlantic Ocean uh, uh, in 2010. So, you know, this is the top of the top in terms of uh, robotic technology. And it was a real privilege to be able to use it in, in Yellowstone Lake. Then on the other side of the spectrum, you have the Corine project, which if I'm gonna be honest, that's some stone age tools. Um, it's two Carolina skiffs that are rafted together with an aluminum superstructure and then a coring rig, uh, that a tri uh, not a tripod, but I don't know, quadrupod or a tower, I guess, uh, that gets uh, put up there with a pulley. And you take a 12 meter, you know, 40 foot long or so uh, pipe, you rig it up on that thing, um, you put a whole bunch of weight on it, and then you lower it down towards the lake floor. And when it's within so close, you free spool it and let it slam down drive itself uh, 40 feet into the sediments, and then you pull it back up. So it was a real spectrum of technology used on this project. I'm gonna to try to tell you a little bit about the results from each. And this is what it looks like when you pull up those cores. Um, there's a plastic sheath that you end up cutting up into sections. Of course, you gotta be careful how you label it. So when you get back in the lab, you know, top doesn't become bottom or something stupid like that. Um, but each of the sites, you end up with uh, a length of core recording that sediment and geological history of the lake. So on the right, or sorry, left panel, we have a map of Yellowstone Lake again. And what you can see is this area called the Deep Hole. It, it's not a very imaginative name, but it is accurate. It's the deepest part of the lake, and it's a hole. Um, and it's about two kilometers uh, east, southeast of Stevenson Island, um, right here. And this, by the way, is the explosion crater from the Mary Bay explosion that we were talking about earlier. Um, and so this was what you know, we called our focus site. This is where we deployed a lot of our instrumentation and really focused a lot of our efforts in terms of monitoring to try and understand what's going on. And on the right panel is an example of a map of this area that was made by the free swimming robot, um, where we're going from sort of 115 meters uh, all the way up to 80. So this is like a 30 foot, this, this is, uh, sorry, 30 meter, you know, 100 foot or deeper hole in the lake floor sediments that's created by the hydrothermal uh, fluids that are discharging in this area. And these white uh, triangles are places where we saw active venting um, with Yogi, the, the uh, remotely operated vehicle. So you can see that, you know, the whole, it's, it's got kind of a length scale of maybe this particular one, 300 meters by about 200 meters. Um, and you've got this cluster, intense cluster of hot fluids that are coming out of the lake floor and then a little uh, less intense as you move up to the north here. So what do those vents look like? Um, they look like this. Uh, I could play a movie here for you. This was the uh, Yogi dive video. So here you can see hot water coming out of this uh, sort of crack or, or vent, if you will, and it's being populated by filamentous bacteria these are microbes that eat sulfur. Doesn't sound like much fun to me, but that's what they do. Um, and these are really unique life forms. There's a whole component of our project that's focused on uh, understanding these bizarre heat sulfur loving life forms. Most of us don't necessarily like either. Um, but I can't tell you a lot about it because I'm not a microbiologist. What I can tell you is that those filamentous bacteria share something with all of us right now, which is that they are being attacked by viruses. I can't tell you much deeper than that, but my microbiologist friends on the project assure me that these uh, sulfur-eating bacteria are being attacked by viruses. So I guess 
nobody's safe no matter no matter where you are. Um, and one of the things that we did, which was really innovative, and this was the University of Minnesota team, designed a system that we could basically encase one of those areas where the fluids are coming out and put a sensor inside the, the vent that allows us to measure the temperature and composition of the fluid that's coming out of the lake floor over an entire year interval. And so if we're trying to understand how the system responds to changes, we have to measure the changes that are occurring and measure how the system responds. So this was a really key aspect of us being able to understand how these systems were responding. We could get this fluid composition and temperature data over an entire year interval. And this is kind of fun. Um, so you saw in the previous movie what it looked like when we put that instrument into the vent. And this is a picture from when we took it, we came back a year later to take it out. Looks a little different. Um, it's been populated by all these microbes, microbial organisms. Uh, it turns out, you know, they just needed a place to hang out. Um, but the good news is we didn't let this go to waste. We sampled all of these organisms before we retrieve the instrument. And so one of the, you know, there's too many results. You know, if I had all day, I still couldn't tell you everything. Um, so I just want to highlight a few things. And one of the results that's come out of this, and I apologize a little bit. This is a, <clears throat> an image from a scientific publication that's going to come out probably in the next uh, month or so. Uh, so some of the stuff you're seeing before other scientists even get to see it. So special, special job. Um, but what it's showing here, you know, this blue, this is the water, this is the lake water. Then the green here, this is the lake floor. And then this kind of thing here is this depression where the venting is coming out. And what we found, and we've uh, corroborated this through two completely different lines of evidence, is that underneath the lake floor, about 15 meters down, you have some kind of a cap, uh, like a clay layer, very low permeability sediment material that has trapped a steam reservoir underneath the lake floor. So you think about that just for a minute. At the deep hole, about 15 meters, so let's say 50 feet below the lake floor, there's a large reservoir of trapped steam. That has implications, and what if you want to think of it, you know, in kind of uh, everyday terms, what you can imagine is there's basically a steam wand under the lake that's just continuously injecting steam into this area underneath the deep hole, and there's some kind of cap 15 meters down that's arresting that steam and trapping it, and preventing it from sort of being flooded with, with lake water. And this is really interesting because, so that means that this is a, one of these um, vapor dominated fields. So when the fluids come up, the steam and gases that boil off, this is one place where they come out. But everywhere else in the park where we find these kind of systems, we find them at high elevations, high altitudes. And the thinking was that you could have this steam below the ground surface because the water table at the high altitudes was much lower than the altitude of the ground surface. So you could accumulate steam between the water table and the ground surface. And what we're found here turns that upside down and on its head because now we have steam that's overlaying, you know, lying under, uh, 140 meters of water. And so how you can preserve, trap and preserve steam beneath all that water is a question, is one of the active uh, questions that we have. We know it's there. We're still not entirely sure how it can be there. Then just to wrap up uh, the science, I hope I've done okay with, with time here. 
Uh, I just want to say a quick word too about the coring program. Um, the, 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 the sediment cores that we took, you can kind of try and imagine what it's like. Um, uh, we had six different sites uh, where we took these sort of think on, on the order of 10 meter long cores and they each have their own kind of unique history, but we know they're all telling the same story, but you have to decipher it. And it's really hard work and it takes a lot of dedication and, you know, like losing family and friends for a couple of years. I think the lead scientist <laughs> who was working on this may have to reconnect with, with her family sometime soon. Um, but at the end of the day, um, and this is also a figure that has not been published yet. So you're getting the sneak preview, uh, getting a jump on the scientists here. Um, there have been at least 16 hydrothermal explosions in Yellowstone Lake since the last glaciation, which as I mentioned was about 13,000 years ago. So that's, you know, averages out to a little more than one every thousand years. And one of the uh, really interesting aspects of this research is and our project has really uh, laid this uh, plane to see is that there are very, very much two distinct types of explosions. And the most prevalent, and if you look on this chart here, it's these red bars. <clears throat> and this is, you know, the way geologists, the way we do it, uh, Ka is thousand years before now. So zero is now. And then you go back to the glacier and you can see all these small explosions. You know, some of them were like a hundred years ago or something. So not that long ago. Um, and these, you know, are small burps uh, is one way to think of it. Um, and we think that these are associated with, gas. you know, that steam reservoir. If you have gases suddenly escape from that reservoir, of course they expand as they depressurize. And that could be a likely uh, mechanism to explain these deposits formed by these very much smaller explosions. And then there's sort of a different class, the large catastrophic ones. Um, and these, you know, these would be a real, a real problem uh, if they happen now. Um, the last one in the lake, the Elliott's Lake, was about 8,000 years ago. The biggest one, Mary's Bay, was something around. 13,000 years ago. And these are cases where you have hot liquid water that gets depressurized and flashes to steam. And a steam molecule occupies about 1,600 times larger volume of space than a water molecule does. Another way to say that is steam is much less dense than liquid water. But what that does when you change liquid water molecule to steam, it needs to have 1,600 times more elbow room to move around. And that basically causes a huge catastrophic explosion. You blow all the uh, uh, material, the liquid itself that's turning to steam blows out, the ground, the sediments, the rocks that are encasing those fluids get blown out. Um, and so, you know, there are two of those in the lake and then, you know, some pretty big ones, Turbid Lake, which is right next to Yellowstone Lake, for those of you who are familiar in Indian Pond. And so these are probably a very different sort of triggering mechanism. In this case, you know, it probably takes a, something like a large earthquake that creates a lake tsunami. The breaching of a glacial dam, as I mentioned, uh, I don't think we have to worry about that anymore. Um, but the, the large earthquake uh, lake tsunami scenario is definitely uh, something that, that we need to be mindful of um, going forward. And that sort of does it for uh, what I had planned. And, you know, if you have questions, I know we're going to answer those at the end. So I just want to, as a, by way of a segue, uh, give a, say a quick word about Chris Linder, uh, who's photographed here, three different photographs. You know, I searched my archives. I've been working with Chris for over 20 years. And I couldn't find a picture of him without a camera in his hand. And I think that, that really kind of says uh, the whole story in a way. But I've been uh, literally all over the world with Chris. He's followed some of my other projects as well. And he is the hardest working guy in science photography. He gets up before the scientists. He goes to bed after the scientists. 
He's always running here, there, rigging up some new way to take a picture. Um, it's remarkable how hard Chris works. Um, and I think you're gonna understand a little bit more about that when you get to see some of his photos. Uh, so with that, I'll yield the, the floor and let Chris say a few words. Oh, thanks a lot, Rob, for the introduction. I'm gonna share screen. Okay, so I'm gonna take you through my side of the story, which is different from, from Rob's. My, I'm coming at this amazing scientific project from the perspective of a storyteller or another way I like to think of myself as, as, as a science interpreter. So I use photographs and video to tell science stories to make them more accessible and relatable to the public and help them engage and ask questions of the scientists um, and really help get the word out to the broader public about the amazing work that scientists like Rob and the team are doing in the lake. So the, um, I wanna thank you know, Nathan and Corey and all the team at the Center of the West for the beautiful exhibit that they created. I haven't seen it myself. I've just seen pictures of it on the walls. It looks fantastic. Um, I'm really excited to someday get there and see it myself. Um, it'll have two showings uh, in Cody there. And I hope uh, as many of you uh, who are in the area are able to go see it in, in person and see it on the walls and enjoy it. Um, the second exhibit is gonna have some special um, artifacts that are also gonna be with with the photographs, I think it's 25 photographs on the wall, some interpretive panels. And um, we've also got some video that we're sharing with that as well from, from Yogi, the, the submersible vehicle. So a little quick bit about my background. Um, as Nathan explained, I'm a former oceanographer. I, my previous job as physical oceanographer was to work on ships like this. This is the uh, research vessel Oceanus in the uh, Gulf Stream in winter. Um, so my job was to kind of help get instruments over the side, bring them back, do data processing, um, work with scientists to get the results published. Um, but over the years, I transitioned to photographing science. I've had the amazing opportunity to photograph the man submersible Alvin here in the Gulf of Mexico. And then also um, those photos from the Arctic that Rob showed you, this is one of the photos from that project where I spent six weeks on the Swedish icebreaker Odin with, uh, with Rob and his team looking for uh, life in another set of vents, this time at the bottom of the Arctic Ocean, which was an incredible project um, and one that, that I will never forget. And so here's, here's Rob being pressured to do a portrait um, when he's not wrangling scientists and desperately trying to get the ice to work his way on the icebreaker. Um, you know, Rob is a fantastic guy to work with, always tremendously upbeat. And as you can tell from the last presentation, adept at, at, at telling science stories himself, at taking complicated scientific data and making it really, really interesting and relatable to the public. So it was a real pleasure when Rob invited me to work with him again on the HDY project. I'd never, I'd, HDY Lake project, I'd never run the Yellowstone before. Um, so that was both, um, you know, a treat and also intimidating to me as a photographer because obviously so much uh, photography has been done in this park. So many people visit it. Um, but this was a unique opportunity to take a look at a subject that doesn't get a lot of photographic attention. I mean, let's face it, most of the attractions in the park are, 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 have a heartbeat or they're, you know, spewing steam into the air at one of the geothermal areas. It's not really the lake. So I had an opportunity to, to, uh, to tell stories about a, play, a part of the park that didn't really get a lot of attention. And then of course, being embedded with the scientists, I got to tell a story of how they did their jobs, what tools did they use, you know, what did they, how did they um, accomplish this mission under somewhat difficult circumstances. 
a lot of times. I want to show a couple of pictures of and examples of how I do my work and how I approach a story like this. Um, one of the first things I do is work on establishing shots of what is this place like? Um, how do you uh, set the scene, if you will? You know, what is what is this environment like? I tried to capture the lake in all of its different moods, and it has many, many moods, as I found out from working on this project. This was, you know, a somewhat benign, beautiful day. You can see just for a sense of scale, this tiny little dot um, on the lake is the coring rig platform that, that Rob showed that's taking cores um, from the bottom of the lake, just to give you a sense of scale. I needed that coring platform in this shot to give you an idea of the size. I mean, you obviously have mountains in the background, but um, this is a really, really big lake. And I wanted to get that across too, as this is a, it's a unique environment. You know, the, it's, it's very difficult to get a sense of, of what's underneath these waves. And in this case, this calm water on the lake, there's only a handful of spots around the lake where you can see active geothermal areas from just standing at, you know, on one of the boardwalks. And West Thumb is one of those places. Um, so this is the um, feature called Fishing Cone. I timed it at, um, at sunset and the moon was just coming up. It just happened to work out um, for this shot. Did a long time exposure to smooth out the water to really focus our attention on that one feature. But I see this, I use this image as kind of like a hint of what lies beneath just a little sampling of, of what's underneath that surface and give this idea that this is a unique lake and that it's, it's not like others. It has this amazing uh, geothermal system underneath it. There's very few places you can actually see something like this from the surface. I also wanted to show, you know, what this lake can be like on an angry day. And in uh, the case of the research team, we were often going out in the research vessel before dawn because this was a pretty typical condition in the afternoon on the lake when the winds built up. And when the waves are like this, it's too difficult to do work on the vessel on the lake. So we tended to be out on the water really, really early, um, especially in, uh, when the coring project was, was going on. If you can think about, you know, trying to get a, a 30 foot section of sediment up from the bottom, 400 feet down, you know, on two skiffs that are, that are uh, joined together with a plant, with a, <laughs> with that uh, big apparatus on top, you know, you need absolutely calm conditions for, for that to work. But the lake was often like this. And uh, the research team got chased off the lake a few times because of these uh, wind, wind and thunderstorm events that would blow up and create some pretty significant wave action on the lake. So one of the th things I knew I also had to do in order to communicate one of the important features of the lake, um, these hydrothermal explosion craters, Mary Bay being the one that I, that I absolutely needed to photograph, I needed to get up high and, and see it from above. And so I worked with uh, this pilot, Chris Boyer, who I've known for a number of years. He donates his time to fly his little red plane through an organization called Lighthawk, uh, which helps uh, scientists and conservationists um, get an aerial perspective of their work. And so I had a great privilege of uh, flying with Chris from Montana over the lake. Um, we spent about, I think an hour, an hour and a half flying over. Unfortunately, we had some really severe um, forest fire conditions. So visibility was absolutely awful. Um, it was, you know, I was breathing in smoke when we were up in the air. We had the, we had the windows open so I could shoot out of an open window. Um, but I managed to get a shot showing this, um, this two and a half kilometer diameter Mary Bay crater. Um, you know, from the surface, from the road, you just don't get a sense of the scale of the size of this crater. And so this was an important, important image for me to make. Despite the forest fire conditions, I knew that, that I had to get a photograph that showed the scale of, of this crater um, to tell the story of, of, this, of the size of it. Also managed to get some, some top-down shots at West Thumb Basin. Again, showing this transition of, of just how active these geothermal areas are right at the lake shore as it's transitioning into the lake and give you a sense of, of how the, the kind of terrestrial and the aquatic 
zones connect there. The stuff that you can see and that's really popular um, with the tourists in the park and then the great unknown, um, which here is this big empty area of the lake, but in fact is, has, there's a lot going on beneath. So here's a photograph of, um, of Annie heading out at sunrise. Um, Rob was driving the small boat. We knew that in order to get some photographs of Yogi and of Annie, uh, we had to get off the vessel itself. It's a very small uh, boat and it's hard to get the perspective of Annie within the environment unless you're, unless you're off the vessel. So we rented a small boat and, and uh, Rob was driving me around um, for a couple of mornings as we photographed Yogi at work inside the vessel. It's very, very cramped. It's pitch black. Um, the operators are operating um, little joystick controls to drive Yogi around. Um, so it was difficult to photograph, but it was the only way that I could show, you know, just um, what it was like to work in this, in this environment on the lake. This is really, once, the, once Yogi was in the water, this was, um, this was the whole scene for the next, I think six or eight hours that, that the vehicle was down on the bottom working. Here's another example of a photograph of one of the monitors. So it was our, there had this incredible bank of monitors which showed everything that Yogi could see on the bottom. And um, I used, you know, a higher perspective, basically crawling up on top of the, of, the, of the lab area on the vessel to be able to get a view of what it was look like as um, Dave LaValvo here is letting out cable um, for Yogi to, uh, to be uh, deployed off the stern of the, uh, or off the, um, off the vessel. Then um, from, the, from the small boat that Rob and I had rented, I was able to use an underwater housing to get some photographs of Yogi going into the water and driving around before dive. So that's how we got these half in, half out shots and beautiful calm day um, really early in the morning. I knew it was really important to be able to photograph Yogi, um, it's once it, you know, goes, goes down below the waves, um, we've got all the video feeds on the vehicle itself, which are showing us what Yogi can see, but I also wanted some photographs to show this amazing, um, amazing technology that was being used to explore the bottom of the lake um, from the perspective of, of being away from it. And the, the second uh, part of the science expedition that I really wanted to communicate, which Rob um, described was the coring operation, which happened in September. And so as opposed to all the um, yogi operations, which happened in August, September was almost the start of winter when uh, the crew was assembling the platform. Here you can see it's kind of halfway assembled in this photograph. Um, it was actually snowing and sleeting for the whole day that they were putting it together. I wanted to communicate that um, with photographs like this, showing the kind of environments that scientists are working in. And then once it was fully assembled, again, Rob and I went out in the skiff to photograph uh, the work on the platform out on the lake. By using a GoPro and putting it up on a, uh, on a mount, I was able to get a top-down view of this platform, which shows you just how cramped it was. Um, one of the things I have to be aware of as a photographer is not to, uh, not to get in the way um, when the scientists are working in these really, really cramped conditions. Um, this was you know, not one of my favorite photographs, but it's kind of a behind the scenes one uh, showing you just how little space you have to work on this tiny vessel. Um, and and uh, just a, a, a top down perspective on, on everybody that's on that, uh, on that small uh, ship. This is an eye level perspective of a couple of the, couple of the team members, you know, securing some of the cores. This is probably right before we were heading in because you can see some of the storm clouds building and uh, the weather's about to turn here. But it's one of my favorite shots because it really shows, you know, the science in action, the intensity um, on their faces as, uh, as these guys are working to get the work done, just how dirty they are, covered in mud from a long day. It probably started before dawn on the lake. Here's another last shot of Rob, you know, getting his hands dirty, working with these cores. Um, I have tremendous respect for Rob and everybody on the science team 
you know, uh, they, they work super, super long hours uh, for the project and um, are not afraid to get really dirty doing it. And um, so that's one of the things that I like to do for my job is to communicate kind of these behind the scenes moments, um, these aspects of the science that don't make it into the scientific papers. You know, they may not make it into the news releases and press releases that go out. But to me, it's a really important aspect of, of, of what is science and what it's like to be a scientist. And, and I enjoy telling these stories. And the la last part of the day, you know, after a long day of collecting the cores, I really loved this sequence of shots that I did uh, because it was, you know, this aspect of, of teamwork of everybody coming together. It was lit entirely by headlamp. And this is on the, uh, on the shores of the lake. Scientists hurriedly extracting the cores from the tubes, carefully labeling them and getting them ready for transport so they could be analyzed later. Um, but I always love this moment kind of just at the very edge of the day as it's about to get dark, they're still just feverishly working um, to get the course prepared. And um, that was just another one of these behind the scenes aspects that I love to photograph. Here's a panoramic uh, photograph that Nathan provided of the exhibit. Um, if you get a chance, once again, I'm gonna make a, a plug to go see it in person, see the photographs. Um, uh, read the captions because I've got stories that go with each one of these photographs. And um, I want to thank everybody um, from the museum for, for making this incredible exhibit happen. And I want to thank the science team and the National Science Foundation for funding the exhibit. I also want to thank the staff of Yellowstone, Yellowstone National Park as well for being really accommodating with both my aspect of photographing the science and for um, accommodating the science work. Too. I want to thank Lighthawk and Chris Boyer too uh, for the incredible opportunity to photograph Yellowstone from the air. And if I've left anybody out, I apologize in advance. And here's a uh, last slide, just a couple of links where you can learn more. The HDY Lake website has a series of blog posts that uh, Rob and I put together during the years um, that the expedition was ongoing. Uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution's website is next and in the center of the west where you can see more about the exhibit and lastly is is my is my website excellent chris rob thank you so much i can't thank you enough for for again your time and your expertise and and uh, everything you've shared with us so uh we'd like to turn it over to our viewers for their questions and i've got a number of those uh, on, on the ready. Uh, again, for those of you watching via uh, Zoom here, you can submit your, can submit your questions uh, using either the chat or the Q&A feature. And uh, viewers over there on Facebook can share your questions in the comment section. So to start off, Chris, since you just ended, uh, I'll give you a second to, um, to just enjoy uh, sitting. Uh, Rob, uh, how do these vents in Yellowstone Lake differ from or resemble hydrothermal vents in the ocean? Nope, Rob, you're muted. Uh, I see that happen to other people and laugh at them all the time. Um, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, and the simplest answer is the incredibly large difference in pressure. So, you know, Yellowstone Lake, as we were mentioning, the maximum depth is around 115 meters. So, you know, uh, off the top of my head, 400 feet. Um, for example, one of the places where uh, I dove uh, in the submersible Alvin and had a large field program over multiple years is called the TAG hydrothermal mound in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And that's at 3,600 meters. So, you know, 30, more than 30 times deeper and, you know, about two miles, if, if you like the English units better, uh, about two miles deep. And so at those incredible uh, pressures, we don't see typically, um, the amount of steam and gas that you see uh, in Yellowstone um, because the fluids are so much hotter and they haven't decompressed, they haven't 
boiled off a lot of steam. Um, and that has all kinds of implications. Um, one of the things that's interesting about deep sea vents, and this is a little off topic for Yellowstone, but it does kind of circle back. Um, you know, in the same way that if you look at the way um, different species, um, you know, on land are distributed, um, uh, different animal species, um, you don't see everything everywhere. There's niches and there's a biogeography, as people like to call it. And you actually get that in the ocean. So you have uh, extremophiles that are common to the Pacific, you know, the Northeast Pacific, you have different types that are in the Atlantic or the Caribbean. And so you get different types of uh, flora and fauna, uh, depending on where you are in the same way that you get, you know, different kinds of trees uh, if you go across the different parts of the earth. But the main difference is the very, very high pressure. Excellent, thank you. Another one for you, Rob. Uh, did the ROVs, AUVs, and instruments require any modification to operate in Yellowstone Lake? Uh, the, short, the short answer is not really. Um, uh, there were some. Now, mind you, the ROV Yogi, and I just love that, um, you know, our, the instruments that we put on the lake floor, we referred to them as picnic baskets, okay? Um, but the ROV was, specially designed to be able to work in Yellowstone Lake on the research vessel Annie. So any modifications that you would have needed from a deep sea system were already in place on that. And, and that was primarily size. Everything had to be miniaturized. Um, I don't know how well you could tell, you know, from the, the pictures, but um, Yogi is sort of like the size, I don't know if you stacked two picnic tables on top of each other or something. It's, it's something like that size. The ones uh, that we use uh, in the deep sea are more like, you know, a Chevy Tahoe or something. They're much larger. Um, and so there's some miniaturization that had to happen to make uh, any work. Um, the AUVs that I showed you, you didn't, we didn't really need to do much. It's just harder to get them in and out of the water. Um, because normally we'd be on a much larger vessel with a taller overhead crane and so forth. Probably the main thing, and I hope this doesn't get me in trouble. <laughs> Anytime someone says that, you know they're about to get in trouble. Um, but in the deep sea, so for example, one of the uh, instruments that we deployed in the lake uh, was a seismometer. We actually deployed 10 seismometers on the lake floor. Uh, I didn't have time to tell you about any of that, but very exciting stuff there. Um, but in the ocean, you know, ocean bottom seismometers, um, we throw them over the side of the ship and they have weights on them that cause them to sink all the way down to the seafloor. And then when we want to get them back, we can communicate acoustically with them and send little beep, beep, boop, boop, you know, like little R2D2 sequences. And when they hear that, they respond back. Beep, 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 and then they release the weight. So they'll leave a lead weight on the seafloor. And now once they've jettisoned that weight, they're now positively buoyant, like you know, a bubble or something. And then they rise back to the sea surface and we pick them up. You're not allowed to leave anything on the floor of Yellowstone Lake. And I wouldn't want to even if I was allowed to, but you're not allowed to. Um, and so we had to modify the instrument so that rather than releasing a weight, it released a, a, a latch that would pop up a float and we'd grab the float and then pull the whole thing up. Um, so there's sort of like a leave no trace, which is different, you know, in the middle of the ocean, you can drop a lead weight. Um, you don't wanna do that in Yellowstone Lake. Interestingly enough, that same instrument, the way those uh, anchor releases work is you have a, an insulated wire and you cut, a, a, you nick the insulation and cut it off so that, you know, maybe a half inch of the wire is raw exposed uh, wires. And then when they want to release the weight, you put a voltage across that wire. And because of electrolysis with seawater, because of the salt in the seawater, the wire dissolves. And then that's what releases the weight and allows the instrument to come up. Yellowstone Lake is fresh water, so that doesn't work. You can't dissolve a wire. There's no really no salt in the water. 
So we also had to uh, redesign the, the release mechanisms. Um, but for the most part, the, there wasn't a lot of, of redesign. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Chris, a question for you. Uh, you touched on, on some of them, but were there any uh, particular challenges unique to this trip that made it different from some of the other expeditions you've been on? Well, I'd say there, a lot of the challenges were similar actually. Working on Yellowstone Lake was a lot like working on an oceanographic project, you know, once we were on the lake. One of the biggest differences though was actually being in a major tourist location in August on shore. So that was a huge uh, change for my normal um, kind of expedition or, or um, photography trip that I go on. I typically work in areas that are really, really remote. You don't have the opportunity or, you know, to go, you know, you know, to, to really see anybody else while I'm working. Uh, so it's, and, you know, and sometimes that was great. And, you know, we got to chatting with people while I've got, you know, a camera set up on the side of the lake, photographing the lake, or, you know, sometimes it was annoying when you're stuck in a traffic jam and you're, you know, because, because, you know, people are watching bears or something and I'm trying to get down to a location. Uh, but that was probably the biggest difference for me was, was working in this place that um, had a huge population of, um, of tourists there in the summer. Um, but it was, it was really fun overall. I think, you know, I would, um, it's just such a unique, amazing place. And I got to explore a bit of it, um, just a tiny bit of it, I think, you know, it's really big. But uh, um, in terms of working on the, on the boat and, and, and on the coring vessel and such, that really felt like a miniature, you know, oceanography expedition. You know, it, once, you're, once you're out there, it's just a matter of, um, of uh, not walking off the side of the vessel because it's so cramped, you know, when I'm backing up. That's the, that's the main thing. I'm used to working on bigger ships. So those were, those were some small ones. And it, it, it had some restrictions. You know, there were a lot of times I wasn't able to go out because there just wasn't capacity on the, on the vessel. So, so that was a challenge too. That was hard. Normally, you know, you go out for 30 days on an oceanographic vessel, everybody's that's on the vessels in, that's it. Um, in this case, you know, teams were going out different days and I wasn't you know, able to go out with every, every time the, the boats were going out. So that was just one of those, uh, you know, challenges. Again, as Rob explained, it's just uh, um, working with size constraints with the lake. Great, thank you. Uh, all right, Rob, I'm gonna try and combine a few questions here uh, in, into one really big one. Uh, so part of it is we've got a group of students who are joining us and they are wondering when the last time there was one of these big explosions and questioning when, if, if the research indicated, uh, when it might be due to, might have one of these explosions again. But then to piggyback on that, a few other questions uh, that kind of connected to the research and the coring, uh, were there any concerns with the coring of, of breaking through uh, the cap and causing a steam explosion? Um, did it happen? If so, what were the repercussions? What was the first question again? <laughs> um, so the, the first part was just related to those steam explosions. When was the last one? Okay. And was there any indication of when there might be another? Yeah, so um, the... You know, I'm just thinking back to that last slide I showed uh, with the stratigraphy. Uh, I think the last explo large explosion in the lake was the Elliott's Crater explosion. And I, I think it was around 7,000 years ago. I don't remember exactly. Um, but um, this speaks to a very common misconception about volcanic eruptions and hydrothermal explosions. The sense that you know you could be due for one, and it doesn't work that way. You know, it's it's not like these systems have you know uh, an alarm clock set for you know five o'clock in the morning. Okay, time to you know. Um, there, there's no there's no sense uh, of it being due. Okay, and I would say the same thing for the the volcanic system, you know, which last had a major eruption 640,000 years ago. But that doesn't really tell you anything about its due. These things have all these processes going on uh, in the subsurface. It, if it were somehow possible to, you know, CAT scan, like we can take a patient and put them in a CAT scanner and see everything, 
you know, unfortunately, these systems are underground. Um, and so, you know, as a geophysicist, one of my main jobs, so to speak, is to try to bring that system to light, try to image it using different techniques like seismology or electromagnetics or what have you. Um, so there's no sense that um, that it's due to have another explosion. I think the smaller explosions um, that were those little red bars, I think, you know, there's more of a sense that those are somewhat regular. Um, and so, you know, I think we can expect those to be happening in the future. Now, the question is, you know, what would be the repercussion of that? And, you know, if it was a small enough explosion, probably nobody would notice. Um, you know, what you probably are going to see with these small gas expansion events, what, you know, we think they are, is a great big bubble is probably going to come up through the water column and, you know, on the surface of the lake. Uh, as long as you aren't in a fishing boat where that bubble comes up, you're probably okay. <laughs> um, but so those, you know, those, the things that are pretty likely to continue to happen are, are not particularly dangerous, I don't think, unless you're just really unlucky. The other part of the question was like penetrating the cap. Um, so we work very closely with uh, Yellowstone Center for Resources. And I probably should have mentioned them earlier because they're so fantastically helpful. Um, you know, but one of their jobs is kind of like a policing function, if you will, to make sure the scientists don't do things they shouldn't do. And, you know, you can't pick up a rock in Yellowstone and take it home without a research permit. People probably do, but you're not supposed to. And if you're a scientist that wants to publish uh, analysis of that rock, you know, <laughs> you stand to get yourself in a lot of trouble. Um, so every move that we make, almost in a literal sense, uh, we've already cleared it in advance with the Yellowstone Center for Resources. And if there's concerns, we discuss those. In this particular case, um, we had agreed uh, with uh, YCR, Center for Resources, that we would not conduct any coring operations in active thermal areas. So we didn't. Those 10 to 12 meter cores, those all came from areas that, as far as we knew, were inactive at the present time. Um, now, all that being said, um, I had a strong suspicion that there's going to be a steam reservoir uh, under that hydrothermal field. And there are actually some aspects of the study I designed to try and image that with, with seismic waves which we haven't finished the, the analyses yet. Um, so I suspected that was there, but I did not think it was that shallow. And so when we realized that it's only 15 meters below the bottom of the lake, you know, I got a little, you know, chills, like, ooh, you know, <laughs> that's close. You know, when we were down there, that was closer than I thought it was. So I was surprised that, it, that it's that shallow um, but we were never going to put, you know, try to core off the top of that. Um, and, you know, the other thing to know about scientists is we tend to be pencil neck geeks, but we have no fear. If there's a sample that we want to get, you know, you see these volcanologists uh, abseiling into volcanic craters to scoop up hot lava with a ladle or something. You know, scientists... Uh, if we get our mindset on getting a sample or getting some data, you know, all common sense can can go right out the window. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I have one more quick one that I'll ask you, and then a note. I have a few others that are a little bit more detailed. So, out of respect for for uh, Rob and Chris, I'll go ahead and pass those on to them, uh, and and hope that we can get an answer, which we will include uh, in the uh, on the YouTube uh, link. Um, in the description. Uh, but the last question, in addition to the microbial and planktonic life, uh, did you know any invertebrates or fish during your dives? Yeah, they weren't, a, there's a lot of, I mean, yes. Okay, short answer, yes. Um, but uh, they weren't really uh, associated with the hydrothermal vents per se. Um, Yellowstone Lake is full of, of trout. Um, 
and you know they there's a there's been an ongoing management crisis because you know back in the old days when it was considered trendy for people to screw around with ecological systems people introduced lake trout um to to yellowstone lake and other lakes in the area uh to support recreational fishing and unfortunately uh the lake trout have been systematically killing off the the native uh trout population um which is which has a lot of you know if you've ever took ecology and i'm not an ecologist but you know there's a food web and so there's this cascading effect um and it, it, that it's had on the lake's ecological system and there's a lot of management efforts going into beating back the the lake trout uh effort right now but you would see um you know there's a lot of fish in the lake there's shrimp in the lake um they're real tiny things they don't look like anything i'd particularly want to eat um on the fish i'll just offer one one little science hydrothermal factoid um the hydrothermal fluids that are discharging into the lake are very uh <clears throat> very high in arsenic and other things but I mentioned arsenic because ar arsenic can be toxic. And so the ar arsenic levels in Yellowstone Lake are elevated above what you would normally see in a freshwater lake by a fairly significant amount. Bottom line is, if you go to the lake hotel or something and you want to order the trout, you're okay. You can eat a trout from Yellowstone Lake. Like one, <laughs> don't eat trout from Yellowstone Lake for dinner every night for a year or something, because there is uh, a higher level of, of arsenic that gets into the tissue of, of the fish. Excellent. Chris, Rob, thank you both so much for taking your time uh, out of your schedules uh, to visit with us and share your knowledge, your, your experience, and clearly your passion for, uh, for your work. Uh, another big thank you uh, to our sponsors, Sage Creek Ranch, and the Nancy Carroll Draper Charitable Foundation for their support of the Lunchtime Expedition Speaker Series. Uh, just a reminder, and I, I've shared the link in the chat, uh, that this pre presentation has been recorded uh, and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. And uh, if you missed anything from this uh, or would like to share it with someone, you'll be able to find it there. Uh, stay tuned for email updates on upcoming Lunchtime Expedition speakers. If you've registered for the webinar, uh, your email has been added to that list, which you can unsubscribe from uh, at any time. If you aren't on that distribution list and would like to be, uh, let us know by shooting us an email. Again, uh, Chris, Rob, it's been a pleasure having you join us today. Uh, and thank you to everyone who joined us uh, from all over the place. Uh, be well, and we'll see you for the, Drape the next uh, Draper Lunchtime Expedition. Take care, everyone.